everyone, and welcome to Historia Canadiana. My name is Patrick, and this is a show about Canadian culture and the way it informs this nation's history. Today, we're picking up from a previous episode. Well, more like two episodes, in fact. We are at a point in the show and our chronology where we have actually reached a second generation of a community who has impacted Canada in its perception as an imperial refuge and as a place that is profoundly distinct from America for that very reason, first and foremost. This group, which, if you look back to episodes 6 and 7, initially arrived during the American Revolution and would define their identity, or what was associated with their identity, by being proudly part of this vast and snowy land. As we saw in those very episodes, though, much of what we think of the United Empire Loyalists, which is who I'm talking about in case you didn't quite catch that, comes from their descendants, who painted them as much more loyal and ecstatic of being part of the Canadian project than they actually were. We forget today that many Loyalists were unhappy and returned to the United States because of the failure of the British to quickly deliver on promises of land grants and better living. But of course, some did remain and settled in Canada. They moved out from the Maritimes to Upper Canada and had families, or even arrived directly up through Lower Canada. This is who we will be talking about today. The second generation. This is a generation that saw a noticeable rise in nationalistic sentiment as many saw themselves as this first wave of quote-unquote true blue Canadian-born citizens, those who knew the hardship that their forefathers had gone through to live here, and that recognized themselves as veritable Canadians, not immigrants from Scotland, Germany, or wherever. The claiming of them being the quote-unquote first wasn't quite true, of course, but the writing and mentality of many of them certainly reflected such a perception we'll be mostly focusing on a specific poet and how he reflects how many of the Loyalist descendants impacted and were seen as being part of Canada. His name is Oliver Goldsmith, whose great-uncle is the slightly more famous Irish poet Oliver Goldsmith. Yeah, I got confused there for a moment too. We'll get through this, everyone, not to worry. Goldsmith will allow us to trace the further development of a cultural sentiment in British North America that would coalesce around this generation's idea of having a mentality that was specific to this place, but still inevitably tied to their European heritage. There would, as you might expect, be some issues with this representation, and we'll get to that. The main focus for this episode will nevertheless be a desire to create something that was seen as truly from here, not just written here as inspired by British, Scottish, or American traditions. Before we get started, if you want to help support the show, please consider leaving a review on iTunes or checking out the recommended reading list in the description. If you buy a book through one of the links on that page, there's a kickback to me at no extra cost to you. Anyway, on with the show. Let's start off with a quick revision of who the Loyalists were and how much of an impact they had in Canada. In the midst, and especially in the aftermath of the American Revolution, approximately 30,000 men, women, and children fled the newly formed and internationally recognized United States of America. By the early 1780s, with most of these immigrants from the former 13 colonies having settled in Nova Scotia, the group known as the United Empire Loyalists would become the dominant group in the province. This is relatively unsurprising considering the population of Nova Scotia was about 17,000 prior to their arrival. The colonies in British North America really had a tough time getting a lot of settlers to come to them. While a great deal of the Loyalists and Black Loyalists, who were freed slaves who also came from America, were promised freedom in land grants should they remain within the British Empire and help with the war against the rebels, it became increasingly clear that the British administration had no idea that so many would actually take up that offer. This led to many of the Loyalists feeling rapidly disenfranchised by the lack of any follow-through by the government in Nova Scotia and the Canadas. In that light, it was to be expected that many would return to the United States, despite their initial disavowal of its new form of Republican democracy. Those who did stay would be seen as the precursors of a Canadian identity, but that is mostly a myth. Yes, you will find the likes of Joseph Stansbury and Jonathan O'Dell, who we've talked about on the show before, that wrote about the glories of the British flag 
satirically about republicanism and the Canadian scene. But these were few and far between. Many of the loyalists, who were admittedly of literary and educated inclinations, wrote before coming here, and what they did write had little to no relationship to Canada. This last idea actually kind of gets us onto the topic at hand more appropriately. You see, I'll remind you that, especially in Nova Scotia and the Maritimes, but also a bit in Upper Canada, the Loyalists were big on developing schools and newspapers. This, combined with the population boom that was precipitated by their arrival, would help with the raising of a new generation that was better informed about the matters around them, that had the means and knowledge to express them correctly, and that were large enough in numbers to create a noticeable pool of writers, thinkers, and influential types. A few of them would remain within the Canadian limelight long after their deaths. Before we actually get into our author for today, I want to talk a little bit about where we are in the 1820s and the beginning of the 1830s. What does British North America look like at that moment? We have touched upon the situation here and there in previous episodes, but let's condense it all here for the sake of simplicity. Those who will remember John Galt from episode number 12 will remember that he was a leading part of the Canada Company. This company, like many others that had been assented by way of a royal charter, were tasked with bringing over settlers from the so-called Old World and establishing them in the colonies, like Canada. In essence, the United Kingdom commissioned private companies to exploit and quote-unquote develop the land. The most famous example of this is the Hudson's Bay Company in the middle of North America, which was mostly involved in the fur trade, but that performed some of these extra duties by extension. I mention these companies because by the 1820s, there is an increasing push to not only create them, but maximize their efficiency. Again, pulling from past episode tidbits, this is where there will be an increased amount of encouraged migration from places in Europe where industrialization made manpower less necessary. But in the colonies, where forests and land still needed a human touch, as machines couldn't labor away swaths of land yet, these migrants were perfect. Little by little, migrants from Scotland, Ireland, and even Eastern Europe were brought into lands that had been acquired by the likes of the Canada Company. We therefore see a gradual expansion towards the west from Upper Canada that would take off more ardently by this time. From a political and economic standpoint, I want to talk a little bit about banks and government. And I promise, before anyone skips over this part or abandons the episode wholeheartedly by the mere mention of this topic, I swear that this is related to the overall subject. More specifically, let's discuss something called the Family Compact and the Bank of Upper Canada. While I have an episode planned about what the Canadian colonial administration looked like under purely British rule, we'll still cover a bit of it here just for the sake of context. What you need to know is that positions in British North America were not really voted upon, at least not in any meaningful sense. By this time in Canadian political history, male citizens could vote for the Legislative Assembly, who get to vote on laws and legislation, which is always good in a fair society. But the thing is, this assembly could be vetoed by higher positions which were, well, chosen, not voted into power, by the overseas British administration, which was represented by the colonial office. This is where the family compact comes into play. This was the name given, although not officially, to the perceived network of rich British aristocrats who were continuously put into positions of great power by friends in the Canadian government and was especially referenced in the Upper Canadian context. In Lower Canada, the term for that kind of power coalition was known as Chateau Clique, which literally translates to Castle Clique. As the 1820s and 1830s went along, political reformers, including the famous William Lyon Mackenzie, would often criticize this system as undemocratic and monopolistic. This family compact came under significant criticism after 1821, when the newly created Bank of Upper Canada became associated with and was seen as a way for these monopolistic aristocrats to make more money and have a more direct influence on the upper Canadian economy. Now again, this is just a light and extremely broad overview of the situation in British North America at this time. I focused on Upper and Lower Canada because they are better known examples, 
but similar economic and political situations were present in the Maritimes as well, including where we are talking about today in Nova Scotia. A British elite was chosen to administer over an elected body of nominally practical constituents, as well as the companies that were tasked with getting settlers onto land that would be used to exploit resources and expand British influence westward. The economy was geared towards making the British elite rich, not the colonies. Now with that in mind, and I do really promise that this is all relevant, let's look more specifically at the Loyalist descendants and Oliver Goldsmith. Okay, so good old Ollie Goldsmith. Ah, oh, damn it, that's right, there's two of them. Why did I focus on this? All right, I, I guess we'll start with the Irish forefather for a bit and then go to his great nephew, all right? In the case of the goldsmiths, the main work we will be referring to from the Canadian one is intrinsically referential to one that his great uncle wrote. I won't spend that much time on it, but just enough so that you aren't confused about any references that I make. Also, and this shouldn't happen too often, but if I refer to both Oliver Goldsmiths in the same thought, one will be the Irish Goldsmith, and the other the Canadian Goldsmith. I toyed with the idea of using an Irish accent for one and a stereotypical Canadian one for the other, but y you can imagine how horribly insensitive and ridiculous that came off as. Let's, let, let's just say my voice acting career is not about to kick off. Anyway, the Irish Goldsmith was born in 1728. His early life was actually quite harsh. Despite coming from a well-to-do family and being educated to the bachelor's level in Edinburgh, he was apparently quite unhappy and would be plagued with depleting funds and bad luck for most of his time in school, never making it past his bachelor's degree. He traveled Europe until he came almost full circle by ending up in London in 1756. He was completely penniless by then. From that moment on, he would become increasingly known as a writer, gaining attention with his poetry in 1764 with the publication of The Traveler, and two years later of his novel, The Vicar of Wakefield. Both are considered to be pretty important in the development of 18th century poetry in English, and are considered as quasi-classics, if you will. The work we want to concentrate on for the sake of this podcast, though, is his 1770 poem, The Deserted Village. As the Encyclopedia Britannica puts it, it is a, quote, pastoral elegy. Considered to be one of Goldsmith's major poems, it idealizes a rural way of life that was being destroyed by the displacement of agrarian villagers, the greed of landlords, and economic and political change. End quote. In case you might not remember, this is not the first time that such a theme pops up on the show, especially not within the context of the rapid industrialization of Britain that was going on in this time. Goldsmith's elegy which, by the way, is a term used to describe poems that lament the death or loss of something, is simply noted as an excellent and well-written version of this that deserves to be remembered. The whole thing is a long-form and rather witty poem that sentimentally cries for the loss of human agency in agrarian England that was slowly being lost to an increasingly secure and stable hierarchy and the privatization of land that forces people away from the village, hence the title. In essence, it values the quote-unquote traditional way of life that was much more communal than what it was becoming in Great Britain throughout the 17th and 18th century. Here's an excerpt from The Deserted Village to give you an idea. Quote, The loud laugh that spoke the vacant mind, These all in sweet confusion sought the shade, And filled each pause the nightingale had made. But now the sounds of population fail, no cheerful murmurs fluctuate in the gale. No busy steps the grass-grown footway tread, for all the bloomy flush of life is fled. End quote. So you certainly see, just with this little extract, what I mean when I say that Goldsmith was very much lamenting or crying the fact that things were changing much more rapidly and that there was a certain degradation of moral values and these ideas of needing to be a rural population that really works the land and that stayed together instead of selling out, if you will, to big cities or the big companies. See, this isn't exactly a 21st century problem. With that, 
let's move on to the Loyalist descendants in our Canadian history. Finally, let's flash forward about 25 years to 1794, across the ocean, to St. Andrews in New Brunswick, when a couple of Loyalists, Henry Goldsmith and Mary Mason, gave birth to their son, Oliver Goldsmith, the Canadian Goldsmith. Not long after his birth, though, the family moved to Annapolis Royal in Nova Scotia, before settling for good in Halifax. It is during his time in Nova Scotia's capital that he would secure a job, after having spent many years being as close to idle as possible, that would take him around the world. Among the commissariat of the British Army, which essentially means that he was one of the men who took care of the goods and storage, Goldsmith would travel around the world, from one end of the empire to the next. Starting in Halifax, he would make his way to Hong Kong, before returning to British North America in Newfoundland, before retiring to London, England, in the 1850s. Before leaving on that globe-trotting journey, he would write, in Halifax, a poem that would not be published until 1825 in London, and then nearly ten years later in British North America. This is Canadian Goldsmith's most noted literary accomplishment, and what he would be most remembered for, a long-form poem known as The Rising Village. As one might imply from the name, The Rising Village was written as a response of sorts to Canadian Goldsmith's great-uncle's work that we just touched upon. It allows us to easily talk about the second generation of Loyalists because the Canadian Goldsmith's work is intrinsically tied to what came before it, and to the development of the colonies by those seeking better opportunities in them. As Goldsmith himself wrote in his autobiography, quote, In my humble poem, I endeavor to describe the sufferings they, which are the Loyalists, experienced in a new and uncultivated country, the difficulties they surmounted, the rise and progress of a village, and the prospects which promised happiness to its future possessors. End quote. While, as we'll see, it isn't explicitly about the differences between the old world and the new, the way the rising village portrays life in British North America can certainly be read as a response to the issues that the Irish goldsmith described. The comparisons between both poems have been criticized, both in the 1820s and by modern scholars, with many critics preferring to examine each work in its own right. And we'll get to why many comparisons can cause issues, but there are some links to be made nonetheless, and they allow us to get onto topic more easily. Researcher Tom Vincent summed up the poem rather succinctly when he wrote that, quote, The narrative of the rising village describes the stages of growth in frontier life. The first building, the coming of the settlers, the addition of communal institutions and occupations that shape village life, and the emotional conflicts that come with social interaction and that form the folk history of the settlement. End quote. Because it is quite a long poem, where a lot of topics are discussed, after all, the 1825 London edition clocks in at 560 lines, I think it would be reasonable for me to read two separate passages that help us understand what Goldsmith is going for in The Rising Village. I will be reading from the earlier edition because that is what I have on hand, but if any of you are reading from home, just know that there are little differences between the 1825 and 1834 editions, save for a few editions there should be no difficulty following along. I will read a passage from the start of the poem before moving on to another one that's about 60 lines down. So here's the first section. While truth and virtue in my numbers glow, and guide my pen with thy bewitching hand to paint the rising village of the land, how chaste and splendid are the scenes that lie beneath the circle of Britannia's sky. What charming prospects there arrest the view, how bright, how varied, and how boundless too cities and plains extending far and wide the merchant's glory and the farmer's pride majestic palaces in pomp display and here is the second passage how blessed did nature's ruggedness appear the only source of trouble or of fear how happy did no hardship meet his view no other care his anxious steps pursue but while his labor gains a short repose, and hope presents a solace for his woes. New ills arise, new fears his peace annoy, and other dangers all his hopes destroy. Behold the savage tribes in wildest strain, 
approach with death and terror in their train. So, superficially, these two passages are indicative of the central theme of the poem. We can analyze this work as much as any other poem, but as Tom Vincent points out again, this was a work that was intended to be read by an audience for whom veiled allegories and ironic subtleties would mean little. But they would certainly have understood that this poem was about settlement and the quote-unquote civilizing of the wilderness area, that the heart of this experience lies in the nurturing of good values in a harsh and unforgiving environment. That is the main point of most colonial literature, striving for civilization while recognizing its essential vulnerability. That is why Goldsmith, only a few lines apart, references the building of great towns and the taming of the land, while also warning of the danger still seen as being posed to the European settlers by Native Americans. Obviously, that's what he meant, unfortunately, by savages. With that in mind, let's look a little deeper now at what we can gather about the life in 1520s Nova Scotia and the Loyalists' heritage. As I mentioned before the break, comparisons between the Irish and Canadian goldsmith were a dime a dozen, and not entirely for wrong reasons. Structurally speaking, there are a few points of similarity that can be brought up. The contrasts between the past and the present are what both works begin with, with the Irish goldsmith lauding the British past as much as the Canadian goldsmith does the colonial present. The works then go on to describe in a series of sketches the villages and institutions that are either being built or losing themselves, before finally ending on thoughts about the future of their respective places. In both cases, social history is mixed with moralistic teachings and sentimental outlooks on the physical objects and places that embody the environment. But these superficial comparisons inevitably lead to some problems. Either 19th century commentators ended up disappointed with the quality of the rising village when placed side by side with the deserted village, or they tended to be way too complimentary of the Canadian goldsmith's work. No matter which version you go with, one thing is consistent. The shadow of the Irish goldsmith is always present and distorts any understanding of the Canadian goldsmith. Thematically, the works diverge quite a bit. On top of being less witty and satirical in its presentation, the rising village offers a vague benevolence in its equally vague descriptions. The description of the country store is one exception where the Canadian goldsmith writes with his finger on the pulse seemingly, but otherwise we hardly go beyond such descriptions as a busy mill, humble cottage, or some heedless passions. The Irish goldsmith's tirades against luxury and tyranny of the aristocracy have no real counterpart in the rising village, where most of life he describes is for the best, or at least the best it could be at that moment. Comparing the two is like comparing apples and oranges. And that's where we will be able to return to a more historical focus for this episode. As Desmond Pacey writes, quote, Most critics have agreed that goldsmith's poem is technically weak but it has been hailed for its documentary truth. But, as Pacey goes on to elaborate, and as I agree with, this documentary truth is just like I've been hinting at with the Loyalists and their descendants' view of them, and of Canada. It's warped. While a side-by-side -side comparison of the deserted village and the rising village is all but useless, it does offer a door into how history is perceived or is propagated. The constant attachment of these first generations of Canadian-born writers to their forefathers is something that warps not only our perception of a continuity in Canada, but would have warped our own. The Loyalist descendants, like the Canadian Oliver Goldsmith, amplified the sacrifices of their forefathers as they came to British North America. It created a kind of exceptionalism in their mind from where we get most of our presumptions about Loyalists today. On top of that, as we've noted many times on this very show, 
Many writers and poets were quick to emphasize the good and pleasant things in the fledgling colony. In Nova Scotia, as well as Upper and Lower Canada, a sense of wanting to define themselves as a nation and distinct people within the empire took hold quite strongly, especially after the Napoleonic Wars and the War of 1812, as it was known here. So, the so-called documentary truth that has been associated with the Rising Village can be cast in a different light. Its apparent or claimed relation to the political and social reality of Nova Scotia of the 1820s and 30s becomes more and more tenuous the longer you think about it. That is why I insisted on covering some of the history at the top of the show. At this point in time, Nova Scotia was, much like Upper and Lower Canada, restive under a political oligarchy that was based in Halifax. Its economy was barely its own, and it existed mostly to supply primary resources for the British that needed it for their worldwide endeavors. None of these potential criticisms, which arguably would have made it much more like the Irish goldsmith's poem, are present. The hardships and triumphs of the settlers are too vague for any meaningful extrapolation to exist. Now, I'm not saying that art can't simply be beautiful for the sake of it. Not at all. In this case, though, when the intent was to portray the life in British North America, the rising village comes off as insanely hopeful. This can be good, but it is a mentality that needs to begin with the acknowledgement of certain issues, I feel. I don't want to end on such a downer, though. There are one or two elements that we can give Oliver Goldsmith's The Rising Village credit for. If it isn't a document of the Loyalist migration, it certainly is one that documents the shift in the Canadian imagination. Writers like Goldsmith were ones that wanted to emphasize the choice that was made by the Loyalists to be in Canada, or at least not in the United States for a variety of reasons. In the aftermath of the War of 1812, as we covered in episode 11, mentalities were beginning to change around what it meant to be Canadian. It became less about being British in a foreign and arduous territory, but about the choice to be here and to live according to the lifestyle that this specific place offers. The Rising Village is emblematic in its portrayal of the will to live in Canada, and also of the will to develop a cultural identity in a much more deliberate fashion than what we have covered before on this show. Our past works have often concentrated on British writers who wanted to invite people to come over, or jabs at American republicanism. Things that might be elements of the Canadian mindset, but that haven't quite wanted to be something outside of the French or British tradition, ergo the Loyalists. But while the Rising Village is plagued by the shadow of its own forefather, it set out to create, with varying degrees of success, something that was specific to the Canadian landscape and lifestyle. Keeping the old tradition in mind, and obviously propping it up in some respects, but trying to move past it. It recognized, along with the Loyalist descendants, the possibilities of a Canadian social scene. And that is really what we need to retain from that generation. It was aware of itself as being intrinsically tied to its past, but it wanted to create its own future. As I mentioned at the top of the show, the fact that many loyalists had built up schools, newspapers, and were important in creating a population base certainly helped in the propagation of a perception that they were influential in the overall Canadian scheme. While this means that their descendants were in contact with one another and would most certainly feed off of mutual ideas of Canadianness, it doesn't mean that the feeling of loyalist exceptionalism was consistent across the board. Obviously, what shape this social and cultural scene would take was not unanimously understood by all those of so-called loyalist stock and the other Canadian-born populations that weren't claiming to be of that descent. Pretty soon, we're going to start to not only talk about descent within the Canadian population, but conservatism, and a return to how things had started off in British North America as based off of this perception of what the Loyalists represented for empire, not what they represented for Canada. And some people might feel that I didn't develop the Loyalist descendants as much as I could have. I've alluded a lot to this idea of multiple visions of the future, 
But I felt that it would bog down the show too much if I started talking about that many ideas in one episode, that we're going to touch upon them as we progress in our chronology, in upcoming episodes actually. So keep that in mind, keep a lot of the basis that I set up here in mind, or re-listen to the episode if you want. But we're going to really delve deeper and deeper into the founding blocks that are really solidifying in the Canadian landscape. As much as we talked about a rising and better articulated identity, this also meant that arguments about it were inevitable. So, was this a bumpy cultural start? Yes, I think I demonstrated that pretty fairly today. But it certainly is a start. Okay, that is it for this episode. Thank you everyone for listening. I know it was a bit shorter this time, But as we're going along, there are more and more moving pieces that we can identify within the British North American and eventually Canadian context. And so I want to take a bit more episodes to talk about these individual pieces, which might lead to a bit shorter episodes, although it's not going to be that much shorter, just so that we can get a better sense of it as a whole, right? Because as we're going along, populations increase and ideas about the future of Canada get more and more varied, as I just mentioned. So you get this increasing mix of ideas that I want to explore different aspects of so that we can better understand where they went. Anyway, that's for another episode, but I'm just indicating where we're heading. You can reach out with any questions, comments, or concerns on the Facebook page, through Twitter, and by email. All links are in the description. As always, you can support the show through the coffee page and through affiliate links in the recommended reading page that I set up. Finally, if you could leave a review on iTunes, it would be very appreciated. It really does help to boost the show and get it to more people's ears. For now, I'll just say that I wish you all excellent health and that I hope you and your loved ones can stay safe in these intense times. I'll see you next time on Historia Canadiana. Cheers, everyone.